A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Good Thursday to you. Thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am glad that you are with us today. We've got a busy show for you. Julio Rosas is going to join us in just a little bit from the Washington Examiner. going to be talking about last night's town hall by CNN on gun violence in this country. It was... Uh, unfortunately, about what you would expect from uh, CNN. Nothing, um, nothing new. Uh, a lot of uh, anti-gun propaganda on the part of the uh, host there. There were some uh, pro-Second Amendment individuals in the audience, but uh, uh, they were there, I think, to provide an appearance of balance. And we'll talk uh, with Julio Rosas of The Examiner about that coming up in just a moment. Uh, also coming up later on in the program, we're going to talk with uh, uh, Kareem Shia, who is uh, with uh, Open Source Defense. Uh, this is sort of a... Uh, I, I, I'm actually looking forward to talking to Kareem about what Open Source Defense is all about, because it's this very grassroots, uh, networked, uh, gun culture 2.0 uh, a, a group that uh, is out there talking about um, all kinds of things, including uh, Kareem's piece, which is what we can learn from uh, previous attacks, uh, not just here in the United States, but around the globe, in terms of how to deal with those individuals uh, who are committing uh, these acts of violence. So that's coming up here in uh, just a matter of moments. But I do want to get to uh, a couple of headlines uh, here today, including uh, this one that's breaking Thursday morning. Uh, Walmart employees... Uh, walking out in protest of gun sales. Yeah, so this was out in uh, California. There was a, uh, and it's not at a uh, an actual, you know, Walmart store where this occurred, but uh, at an e-commerce center, uh, according to The Hill. About 40 employees there at the uh, e-commerce center uh, walked out yesterday uh, in protest of the fact that the Walmart sells firearms and ammunition at uh, some of its stores. According to The Hill, other company locations in Brooklyn, New York, in Portland, Oregon, uh, also reportedly saw employees take similar actions on Wednesday to call on the company to change its policies. So we spoke about this at Bearing Arms. I've got a a piece up earlier this week uh, talking about Walmart decided we're not going to make any changes. We're not going to do anything to... Uh, shift our, our policies. Now, Walmart has already, uh, in the past couple of years, taken steps. They've, you know, banned the sale of quote unquote assault weapons or semi automatic rifles. Uh, they uh, do not sell handguns uh, at any Walmart store. So, I mean, they've, they've already done that. And again, that's not enough for some of these Walmart employees, not enough for activists like Alyssa Milano, uh, who were seeking to have Walmart simply uh, uh, ban the sale of firearms and ammunition. Uh, in stores across the country. Now, I don't know about you. I know a lot of gun owners who, based on Walmart's previous actions, don't buy firearms or ammunition at Walmart. I also know individuals that this is basically their only option. Uh, If they live in a small town, Walmart might be the only place where they can buy ammunition without having to drive 45, 50 miles. Uh, You can order online, but, uh, you know, if you got to pick up something uh, right then and there, Walmart might be your only option. There is one state where Walmart has decided it's going to stop selling all firearms. They're still selling ammunition, but they're, they're not selling firearms anymore. Do you know what state that is? It's the state of New Mexico, which just instituted a quote-unquote universal background check law, and that is why Walmart is not selling firearms in New Mexico anymore, because under the terms of this law, every federal firearms licensee, every FFL, every retail gun seller must perform background checks on private sales when somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm you know, going to transfer this uh, a gun to my buddy or uh, hey, my neighbor wants to buy my rifle. We need to go through the background check. The FFL can't say, no, sorry, I don't do private sales. I don't, I don't, do, I don't do background checks. You, you want to buy one of my guns? We'll go through the 4473, go through the dick system and everything, but I, I don't do these sorts of private sales. That's not allowed. So Walmart, uh, concerned, they said about Individuals uh, walking through the store uh, with all kinds of firearms that they might not sell. And so they decided we're just going to get out of the gun business uh, in New Mexico because of this new gun control law. Now, I I think that's an unintended consequence. I I also think for gun control advocates, it's an unintended bonus. 
They're not upset about this. They're, they're not uh, going to try to change the laws. Well, gosh, we didn't realize that, uh, you know, in a lot of these small towns, people are now not going to be able to buy a firearm at all because the only gun store isn't selling firearms anymore. They're going to quietly cheer this development because it's not about just background checks for these gun control advocates. It's about ensuring that fewer Americans and eventually no Americans can legally own firearms at all. And it's not just, you know, I, I said, look, California, Brooklyn, uh, Portland, Oregon, right? That's where these Walmart walkouts were taking place. But I'll tell you what, we're also seeing some uh, folks with a, a, a much bigger platform than uh, an e-commerce employee at Walmart who are also speaking out very vociferously uh, in support of gun control laws. Take a look at this from Trish Reagan on uh, Fox Business. This was on her Twitter feed yesterday. Real Donald Trump has a major opportunity. He can ban assault weapons and invoke strict gun laws and background checks in one executive order. To heck with lobbyists at the NRA. The majority of Americans in common sense supports this. It's time to do what is right for this country. Now, I will be honest with you, that, that one kind of took me by surprise a little bit. Um, I, I don't know Trish Regan, never met her, probably won't ever appear on her show now. Uh, but I gotta say, this is wrong on all kinds of levels. So first of all, the president can't sign an exam. I mean, he, he could, but it would be overturned immediately. President can't ban an entire class of firearms via an executive action. Whether that's President Trump, whether that would be a potential Kamala Harris as president or Cory Booker, you can't do that. Absolutely could not do that. Uh, universal background checks via executive action. Nope, nope, can't do that either. Uh, and uh, other quote-unquote strict gun laws that uh, she wants to see invoked via executive order, no vote of Congress. And then she says, uh, to heck with the lobbyists of the NRA, the majority of Americans and common sense supports this. Look, I think it's entirely possible that a majority of Americans may support some of these laws, but I also believe that's because a lot of these Americans don't know and don't think and don't have to think a whole lot about how these laws would work. If you are not a gun owner and somebody talks about what do you need, we should ban these guns, you know, we need background checks. Okay, right? Probably no skin off your back. You're not thinking about that. You, you will not be impacted by this law or by these laws. Uh, in any form or fashion. So why not support it? And the media does a horrible job of actually explaining what is detailed uh, in these new gun control laws. As a matter of fact, I wrote about this again at Bearing Arms just a couple of days ago uh, in terms of a new poll out of Ohio. Quinnipiac poll showing something like, you know, 89% approval for uh, quote-unquote universal background checks. 48% approval for quote-unquote stricter gun laws. In Ohio. So, yeah, about half the level of support for stricter gun laws than there are for a stricter gun law. What's up with that? How does that even work? Again, I think it's because most Americans uh, know that, yeah, background checks are performed when you buy a gun at a retail store. When you talk about expanding that, first of all, when you say you should be, you know, background checks on sales, I think that that's what most Americans are thinking of. What already happens Right. A background check. When you go into a gun store, you fill out the 4473. You hopefully don't have to wait too long to get your approval, although you might have to wait several days. Um, And and that's what most people think of. Now, you talk about expanding that to private transfers of firearms. And again, if you're not a gun owner, maybe you don't see what's so difficult about this. If you are a gun owner, you probably do. Right. And so. I, and by the way, brief aside, I know it's so easy to get frustrated right now with people who aren't gun owners, people who don't know this issue, who don't think about this issue as much as you do. Try not to be frustrated with them. Try to try to educate them. Try to, to, to help them leave the conversation that you're having with them a little bit more enlightened uh, about what the gun laws currently are and about the troubles with uh, enforcing some of these laws. 
I know it's easy to get your backup these days, but I think it is absolutely not helpful. So when it comes to background checks, universal background checks, one of the questions I like to ask, first of all, to anybody who says, yeah, well, why, why, why would you be opposed to this? It's a real simple question. How do you enforce it? Leave the Constitution aside for a minute. And honestly, sadly, I don't think the constitutional argument works on a lot of these folks anymore because they're ready to scrap the Constitution too. But how do you enforce it? So let's say I want to sell a firearm to you. Um, how does the government know that that's taking place unless we tell them? How do you ensure that this law is actually going to get used? You know, we spoke with the Tony May sheriff in Cibola County, New Mexico. He pointed out that New Mexico's quote unquote universal background check law. Yeah, the same one that's caused Walmart to stop selling firearms in the state. It's a misdemeanor offense. And under the laws of New Mexico, basically an officer has to witness this illegal transfer taking place before they could possibly make an arrest. Or there has to be a confession. Somebody has to tell the officer, yeah, you know, listen, I was over there with my buddy Tom, and uh, I, I've known Tom for 20 years. You know, he's a good guy, but uh, I, I sold him a shotgun, and, and we, didn't, we didn't go to the gun store. Then you could make an arrest on a misdemeanor charge. Other than that, it's going to be really difficult to do so. And so, again, do we want to do something, or do we want to do something that works? Because, quote, unquote, universal background checks is a do-something measure. It's not a do-something-that-works measure. Garen Winnemute from UC Davis in California last year had a big study. Taking a look at the background checks in Washington State, Colorado, Delaware, three states that adopted, quote-unquote, universal background checks. What he found was in Washington State and Colorado, background checks did not increase even though there was a new law put on the books. Delaware did see an increase in background checks. Uh, interestingly enough, though, of those three states... Violent crime went up in all three. Uh, Delaware saw the biggest increase in their homicide rate of the three. Yeah, so the state that actually saw the most increase or an increase in background checks had the biggest increase in their homicide rate as well. Listen, I, Trish Regan, if I haven't ticked you off, I'd love to come on the show and talk with you about this. You're more than welcome to come on this show and we can talk about this. Again, I will talk to anybody across the uh, entirety of the Second Amendment spectrum. Those who want to repeal the Second Amendment, those who say, ah, every gun law should get scrapped. I I'll have a conversation with anybody. It's got to be a real conversation. Matter of fact, let's start our conversations today. Julio Rosas is with the Washington Examiner. He watched that uh, CNN quote-unquote town hall last night. I did not, to be honest with you. I didn't watch it live. Uh, picked up the coverage afterwards. I was watching Pokemon Detective Pikachu with my family, which is better than I expected, actually. But Julio actually put in the hard work, did what so many of us had no desire to do, uh, and watched this anti-gun program. He's here to talk about it. Julio, thanks for coming to the program, man. It's good talking with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you for watching CNN last night, because there was no way that I was going to do that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's understandable. <laughs> you know, and, and you had a tweet, I uh, shared it actually on bearing arms, uh, noting that from the get go, I mean, the fix was in here, you know, uh, Chris Cuomo reads this statement from the NRA about why they're not participating. And based on the town hall, quote unquote, that CNN held last year after the murders in Parkland, Florida, I don't blame the NRA for not taking part. Uh, and yet Chris Cuomo calls the statement disingenuous and says, oh, they're just interested in propaganda. Proving the NRA's point that this was not going to be a level playing field. This was not going to be a conversation. This was going to be uh, an opportunity for CNN to to bash anybody from the NRA that happened to be there. Uh, right. So like, as you said, so he did this right in the beginning of, of the intro. Uh, he said that uh, that the NRA, uh, by not showing up to the event, only wants to talk about the issue of gun violence through propaganda and through their millions and lobbying. Uh, and then, and then he says, and then he, then he just says, well, then let's just be honest. The gun lobby is not going to be the answer anyway. So it's kind of like, well, then why, what was the point of the invitation? If you were, if, if that's your view, if you don't think that the NRA can help in this situation, then what would be the point of, of inviting them? And so it, that really, that really, set the tone for the type of uh, town hall that, that they were going to have that night. 
All right, so I did see that there was at least one gun owner uh, in the audience who who did talk about, and I, I think, you know, was was good that she said, look, we're opposed to violence, too. We're opposed to all kinds of violence. And then she asked a question about a woman's right to choose when it comes to self-defense. Were there other pro-Second Amendment voices that were kind of scattered throughout the crowd? So they had uh, J.T. Lewis, uh, who uh, is the brother of uh, one of the victims of Sandy Hook. Uh, he, he's currently running for, I believe it's state senate over mm-hmm. Connecticut, uh, and he is very pro-Second Amendment. He was in the beginning, uh, in, the, in the middle, uh, and Cuomo did say that they were planning on having uh, Congressman Thomas Massey, who did start the Second Amendment caucus in Congress. But unfortunately, he said that it was due to weather. That, that he was unable to attend. And uh, the uh, and, and for some reason, and they said that he didn't feel it would be uh, good enough for him to just c- come in through a broadcast link. So he, he was unable to attend uh, be, uh, due to that. Okay. And, and that makes sense as well. I think if you're there in a little you know television screen and everybody else is there in person, yeah, you are one step removed. You, you, you're kind of forgotten. Uh, you know, there were a lot of folks there like uh, Charles Ramsey. Uh, there was a trauma surgeon who uh, talked about how we need to ban, quote unquote, assault weapons. Uh, describe overall, Julio, I mean, just the, 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 the tone and did we learn any? Did you learn anything watching this last night? Uh, n- nothing that really hasn't been said before, hasn't been said before was, you know, it was it was all it, it, because of, you know, some of travel delays and travel problems, the, the, the overall uh, consensus of the voices from that uh, town hall was for more gun control, more, you know, more aligned with that. And, and, even, and, even, uh, and even Cuomo at the end of his, his conclusion was talking about how opposing things like universal background checks and assault weapons ban is uh, very hollow uh, at, at best and, and at worst, you know, just plainly stupid. And so the message overall was very much for gun control, uh, which, which is unfortunate because, you know, this, they were talking about having a, an honest discussion and, you know, you have the moderator kind of taking sides in this and that doesn't uh, bode well for, for future town hall events. Yeah. I mean, it is Chris Cuomo. Uh, honestly, I think even, you know, I'm very much a second supporter. I think I could probably do a better job of playing it down the middle over the course of that town hall. You could do a better job than Chris Cuomo did. But it, but, but again, I don't think Chris Cuomo was interested in actually playing a ride down the middle. I think he was interested in, uh, in, in being not just a moderator, but an advocate as well. And I, I guess one final question for you. Did anybody, anybody, any panelist, any moderator, anybody in the audience, did anybody actually talk about what it would take to enforce some of these gun control laws that uh, Chris Cuomo was promoting? Uh, I mean, yes and no, because again, they, they were, you know, just you, you're talking about universal background checks. Uh, they did talk about a little bit about red flag laws. Uh, and so there, there was kind of the enforcement there because the, obviously the, the enforcement would be having police to come and, you know, take guns away uh, from, from people that are considered danger to themselves or others. So, but overall, uh, not not that from what I can remember, it was just mainly again proposing laws, which is very common. They, you're right; they, they they propose these laws that would require massive undertakings, but they don't really talk about that that said massive undertaking to enforce uh, their proposals, like universal background checks and uh, gun buyback programs. Yeah, that's been really disappointing to me because you're right. I mean, look, the proposal is half the side of it, right? But then the actual enforcement is the other side. Once this bill becomes a law, how does it actually work? And it seems like that's something that um, really none of the supporters of these bills uh, want to talk much about. As you say, maybe with red flag laws, but even then they don't want to talk about uh, some of the issues with the red flag laws. It, it's, it's almost just, you know, if we just put the laws on the books, magically they'll be obeyed and enforced. Uh, anyway, Julio, listen, man, I really do appreciate you watching last night. I appreciate you coming on the program. And uh, if we have a Bearing Harms town hall on um, the Second Amendment or, or quote unquote gun violence, would you come on? Would you be a panelist? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to. Excellent. All right, Julio, thanks so much, man. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. 
Julio Rosas joined us from the Washington Examiner here on Barron Arms, Cam and Company. So my next guest actually uh, mentioned CNN and some of the issues that CNN and other media outlets uh, have that actually may be contributing to this problem of uh, mass attacks. And uh, Kareem Shia is his name. He's with Open Source Defense. Got some really interesting perspectives on what we can do to prevent these attacks that do not involve new gun control laws. Kareem, thanks so much for coming to the program today. Thank you. So before we get into your piece at uh, Open Source Defense, what is Open Source Defense all about? Yeah, Open Source Defense is a group uh, I started with a few other folks um, a few months ago. And the idea is to focus um, kind of upstream of politics, upstream of where gun rights folks normally focus, um, and realize that first um, we have to make kind of lay the cultural groundwork. Um, and the emotional groundwork before we can start making all the rational arguments we, we like to make and are important. We have to get that emotion right first. Um, so we're a gun rights group that focuses on that level uh, of the argument. Uh, you know, and it's interesting that you talk about that. I actually uh, have a piece at Bearing Arms last night uh, called It's Personal. Uh, you know, two cases for self-defense and not gun control, uh, talking about David French and uh, Brad Palumbo, who both sort of wrote, you know, their personal experiences about, look, this is why I need a gun. And you're right. A lot of us within the Second Amendment movement, we have this attitude of, well, there was a T-shirt I saw when I was in Richmond, Virginia, at the start of the special session on gun control. And I was standing in line, went and talked to lawmakers. And there was a gun owner in front of me who had a T-shirt, AR-15 on it. Uh, and it said, because, mm-mm, you, that's why. And I get that attitude. I really do. Um, but if you're there, you know, trying to make a political connection with a lawmaker or you're there even trying to talk to gun control advocates, that's not a conversation starter. That's a conversation ender. Absolutely. Absolutely. So go ahead. I mean, even even talking to a friend. So before that, I mean, I, I, I'm always struck by a speech. Uh, it's on YouTube. Steve Jobs gave it to Apple employees when they were launching the Think Different campaign, which kind of turned Apple around. And he made this point that people are really busy and they don't have time to learn all the details of your issue. They don't have time to learn about your product or your service or whatever you're talking about. They have maybe 30 seconds. And you get that to give them your the impression of what you're about and that's what they're going to take away. That's what they're going to tell their friends at the next party they go to. So you have 30 seconds. And we, I think like we, we love to think about tactics, right? We're like tactical. So let's be tactical about the way we approach the debate too, and not just do what makes us feel good. And like, I love memes and all that stuff as much as the next guy. But I think we have to recognize that when we're talking to people who are not in this world, um, we have 30 seconds to lay the emotional groundwork for why gun rights are really important. Um, and so let's approach that tactically um, with an eye towards what's actually going to work and what's going to actually change their mind. Absolutely. Yeah. See, and I'd wear that T-shirt to the range, uh, yeah. but I don't think I'd wear that T-shirt that I was talking about to, uh, to talk with lawmakers. So, so I'm curious, what is your 30-second elevator pitch, Kareem? Yeah. So um, we're, we've, our kind of motto is 100% gun rights, 0% culture war. So we talk about gun rights from the perspective of um, we're not going to shout at you. We're not even going to jump into making, uh, trying to persuade you of anything. I think the trap people fall into sometimes is saying like, well, it's a debate, so let's debate. But the problem is just human psychology is if I sit down and I say, all right, you're wrong and let me tell you why. It's counterproductive, like that, that never changes anybody's mind. So we take a little bit um, of a more long-term view where we say, let's explain why gun rights are important to us. Let's be, we call it easy to like and hard to stop. So we're gonna uh, be easy to talk to, always friendly, but always making a strong case for gun rights. Um, and so we wanna make it so that people can come to our site read our Twitter for 30 seconds. And even if they don't know anything about guns, 
the next time they're talking with friends about the issue, the next time they think about it themselves, they can say, oh, I saw that piece uh, that had those interesting statistics or that interesting analysis of kind of the culture war incentives around this stuff. And it wasn't preachy. It wasn't making any other political points. Um, so like I could post that on Twitter. I could post that on Facebook. I could mention it at a dinner party and not wonder what people are going to think of me. Interesting. All right. Well, this piece at opensourcedefense.org uh, that you wrote a couple days ago, I, I think is one of those that has certainly been circulating around the internet. Uh, it's been shared. My uh, colleague at Bearing Arms, Tom Knighton, wrote about it, which is how I found out about it. What's going on with mass shootings? Lessons from the past solved problems. So what lessons are there to learn that we're not learning right now, Kareem? Yeah, I think so. The silver lining here is it's so easy to get caught in the doom and gloom and it feels so overwhelming. And you have two mass shootings this weekend that, you know, go to sleep to one, wake up to another. And so it's very easy for people to feel like, my God, there is no way out of this. Um, and so the point I wanted to make is this is actually a pattern that has been solved before. And so let's look at how we've done it before and let's apply those same lessons here. Focused on two examples. One was a contagion of uh, suicides in the subway in Vienna in the 80s. They opened a subway in Vienna um, in the late 70s, and through the mid-80s, they got up to a point where they were having uh, nine suicides a month on the subway, people jumping in front of trains. And the media hysteria around this was, was nuts, and every, every week it happened, every well, twice a week. There'd be all these media articles, and it was a kind of a self-fulfilling contagion. So they, they got together, psychologists, media, drew up these guidelines and said, let's, let's still report on this, but let's report it in a sober, kind of non-hysterical way. Um, here are the guidelines psychologically that will work, um, and let's have all the media orgs voluntarily abide by those. And the sui suicides went down by 80%. Um, wow which is wild because nothing changed in terms of people's ability to do that. Uh, and presumably those, everyone's still out there, but you just had 80% fewer people jumping in front of trains. Um, second example, a little more contemporary was ISIS, right? So we had a, a wave and I, there's a graph in the article, a wave a few years ago um, in the West of these lone wolf ISIS terrorist attacks. Um, to the point where there were a few hundred deaths a year from these attacks in countries where ISIS had no physical operation, just spreading ideas, um, in 2015 and 2016. In 2019, we've had zero. Nothing changed in terms of people's ability to do those, right? Because all those people were doing, they were just reading on the internet about this group called ISIS. They were renting a truck, picking up a gun, building a bomb, whatever it is, and then going out and killing people. People can still do that, but they're not. And so why? Um, and so the thing I hypothesize in the article is that ISIS, like suicide, like the subway suicides in Vienna, Vienna and like mass shootings, was a social contagion. So because of the media reporting around it and because of the way we talk about it, it kind of makes it a thing. It makes it this identifiable uh, entity that people who are... Uh, uh, mentally susceptible can latch on to. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell has a great 10-minute talk on YouTube about exactly this. He calls it a threshold theory. So it's a slow-motion riot where each person participating in it publicly makes it easier for the next person to participate because there's a thing they can point to and say, oh, that's what that looks like. And so when people tweet about mass shootings and they say, oh my God, AR-15s, or they ruefully tweet like, this is America, right? Unwittingly, they are writing a script that future mass shooters can latch onto. It makes it an, a definable, identifiable thing. It's plug and play. Um, and so the idea of the article is that if we could find ways to make it less of a thing, less of a thing that we talk about, that's how you kill a contagion. Um, and I think a contagion is what we're dealing with here. So these things have been solved before. We know how to do it and we can do it again. I, I you know, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I have seen that Gladwell speech and, and I think that there's a lot there. I, you know, again, certainly we see this sort of cluster effect 
Uh, we and I think most Americans are aware of you know copycat killers, right? Uh, and I, I think you know we're just taking that one step further, getting a little bit more deeper into all right. Well, what actually causes that copycat effect? You mentioned the media. Uh, in terms of the Vienna suicides and and in terms of their reporting on those suicides. We also, as you noted, we have social media, right? So we can talk about what the big networks and the big papers and the, the, uh, you know, the, the media industry can do. But it sounds like you're also saying that there are things that every one of us, whether you're a gun owner, you're not a gun owner, whether you support gun control, whether you don't support gun control, there are things that we do every day that can either exacerbate the problem or help alleviate the problem. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. One of my colleagues at Open Source Defense, this guy named BJ Campbell, he's written some awesome uh, articles online about gun stuff. So uh, he gets a bunch of traffic to those articles. And he posted um, a message in our, in our group Slack um, after these shootings. And he said, from ad revenue, I made $25 off a mass shooting, and that is the problem. So the problem is, you can be a great media org, and you can say, we're not going to participate in this, but you will go out of business. So there are, there are kind of, um, the incentive structure of the way this works is that you're going to cover it and get those clicks, or you're going to be replaced by someone who does. Um, yep. And so we have to, I think... Um, this is not unsolvable. I think it's a question of social norms. Um, we saw this with ISIS videos where those got a lot of clicks, right? Those were uh, like uh, undeniable viewing. But after a few months, media orgs started to say, you know what, like we think we are contributing to the problem by uh, airing these videos. And after a few months, it kind of became like socially shameful to um, cover those stories in quite the same way. And so I think um, as awareness about this contagion effect spreads um, and hopefully is, is itself somewhat contagious, um, there's sort of kind of social pressure that can be brought to bear against big media orgs. And I think that can kind of set the tone for the way we talk about it online to some extent. I hope so. Uh, you know, and it is worth noting last night, CNN had a quote unquote town hall on uh, on gun violence in which you know it was it was basically just a uh, an infomercial for all kinds of gun control laws you note cnn you say quote literally maintains a mass shooter scoreboard on their site and i don't think that came up in the town hall last night <laughs> i they you know they probably didn't mention that they do that um but uh, yeah a lot of these orgs they have literally cnn the trace a few others they have a page on their site where you can go and it is literally a scoreboard um and you know the people on the forums deeper in the web um they're very aware of that yeah i saw a tweet and i think it was from the twice uh, the trace rather this weekend and it was, was something about you know, the shooting in El Paso is the, the eighth most deadly in U.S. history. And they had their tweet of the top 10 list. Yep. And all I could think of was, you know, growing up playing the arcade games and what it felt like to crack that top 10 and put your initials in on that machine. And it was, I don't know, it was just a little too close to comfort that comparison. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's dangerous. And I think the, I think we need to talk about the fact that like, it seems like you're just posting something online, but I mean, this is the magic of the internet and it's also the danger of it, that information spreads um, and can manifest itself in the real world. That's what makes the modern world great, and, but it's also something that has a downside that we need to understand the power of it. The internet is a tool just like a firearm is, right? And right. It's, it's all in how you use it. Uh, Kareem, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the program, sir. Would you come back at some point? I'd be happy to. I feel like we're just sort of scratching the surface. And uh, opensourcedefense.org, that's where folks can find you and your colleagues? That's right. And we're on Twitter at uh, Open Source Defense. Same deal. Awesome. Kareem Shai, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you. All right. Continuing this conversation tomorrow on Cam and Company, we're going to be talking with uh, more folks with some unique perspectives on uh, this current uh, gun control fight. I would again encourage you if you're watching right now, 
Make sure you're talking to your members of Congress. Make sure you're talking to your state elected officials, your local elected officials as well. Uh, It is vitally important right now. Again, you know the gun control groups are pulling out all the stops to uh, to try to ram through as much gun control as possible. It's not about saving lives. It's not about what works. It's not about what's effective. It's about checking off some agenda items that that have been on their to-do list uh, in some cases for decades even as violent crime has been dropping across this country. And the gun control advocates, again, they, they don't care about the you know mass stabbing in California last night, and at least not enough to talk about it. They don't care about problems in the current criminal justice system, at least not enough to talk about it. Uh, I do, and I know you do as well. That's why I was so bothered when I saw this story out of Houston, Texas. Suspect in pregnant woman shooting death had lengthy criminal history. Mm-hmm. How lengthy? Really lengthy. Uh, Going back a decade or more, Justin Heron. He's 31 years old. He's been charged with capital murder and the death of an 18-year-old pregnant woman whose body was found in a a northwest Houston motel room, according to the Houston Chronicle, accused of shooting and killing Patra Perkins inside the uh, hometown suites. Uh, Now, according to authorities, Harris County prosecutors right now have three open felony cases against Heron. That does not include this most recent capital murder charge. Uh, Evading arrest, unauthorized use of a vehicle, theft. They're all set to be heard by a judge August 16th. Now, you can say, look, maybe the evading arrest could be classified as a violent crime. These are nonviolent crimes. This latest go-round. As it turns out, Justin Heron has a lengthy criminal history that goes back more than a decade and includes aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon, felony assault, and endangering a child, as well as previous evading arrest charges. Back in 2016, Heron was indicted by a grand jury on a felony family violence assault charge after police said that he struck a woman. Case was dismissed after Heron was convicted in a separate case involving an assault on a detention officer. I, I don't, again, I don't get that at all because that's a separate case entirely. In that case, by the way, that he was convicted of, the charge was reduced from a felony To a misdemeanor, Heron served one year in the county jail. 2011, judge ordered Heron to serve a year in prison for endangering a child after running red lights and driving over the speed limit with a child unsecured in a child safety seat. Felony assault on a public servant back in 2006. And, you know, again, doesn't look like he really ever faced any serious consequences. I'm not sure about that... uh, uh, a, a charge by the aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. The uh, Houston Chronicle doesn't note when that took place. But again, it doesn't look like there was any serious jail time for Justin Heron in that situation either. And so again, you've got individuals who are well-known to authorities, well-known to the community, bad actors for a long time, and they keep going into court and getting one of those. Now, our armed citizen of the day, One of the younger armed citizens that we've actually had here from uh, Kentucky, a 14-year-old girl defending herself and her sisters from an intruder there in uh, Lawrence County, Kentucky. This was a Sunday. According to authorities, uh, two guys pulled up in a, uh, a white van outside of this home, or a white sedan, rather, in uh, Blaine, Kentucky, Uh, One of the individuals got out of the car, repeatedly tried to gain entry by trying to kick in the doors of the home. Now, inside that home, there were three teenage girls. Dad was at work. Mom had gone to the store. They called 911 as soon as people started trying to kick in the door. At one point, the guy who was trying to break in, according to authorities, circled around to the backyard and looked like he was getting ready to bust a window with a shovel. So, at that point, the guy with the shovel... And uh, a driver, apparently, started to get into an argument. The youngest of the teenage girls in the home, who was 14, uh, was able to retrieve and load a 9mm pistol. Uh, She shot uh, in the general direction of those two. Uh, And all of a sudden, they realized, oh, we have somewhere else we need to be. We got to get out of here. Daniel Castle, who is a Lawrence County constable, Lawrence County Sheriff's Deputy Corey Cook, responded to the 911 call, uh, looked for the guys, couldn't find them. Uh, Deputy Castle, or Constable Castle, rather, said, I think she did take some necessary steps to protect herself. He said, although she could have done a little bit better, considering that she's 14 years old, she did a good job. I encourage everyone 
that can legally carry a firearm to carry a firearm to protect themselves and their families just in case the need arises. I don't think we saw Constable Castle there on that uh, CNN town hall last night, do you? I don't think his... uh, All kinds of anti-gun law enforcement officers, but uh, like Detroit Police Chief uh, James Craig, he wasn't there. Constable Castle, not there. Just those who, again, want more gun control laws aimed directly at you. All right, let's get to our uh, good deed of the day from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, WSOC TV on the uh, Good Samaritan who helped save a suicidal man uh, in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, Harrisburg, North Carolina. It was uh, Friday night. Eric Torres was actually on his way to get some ice cream. And he noticed uh, as he was driving along two women on the uh, side of an overpass uh, who were talking. And, and then he said he saw a uh, big police presence. Um, the two women who were on the side of the overpass talking to somebody there, and and he said, I just saw the figure disappear. Uh, Police officers on the scene grabbed the man, tried to jump from that bridge. Torres said two of the officers were holding the person's wrist as he was dangling off of 485. Uh, Torres ran to help. He said, just the thought of dropping him and seeing that. He said, I just did not want to be a part of it. He managed to grab the man's waist, and he said, listen to me. You're not going to do this. I've been where you are, but look at where I am now. Torres said the uh, situation only lasted a couple of minutes. He said it uh, felt like a lifetime. He said, me begging him not to do this, he looked at me and he said, please let me go. I can't do this. Torres said, uh, you're wearing a shirt that says God. You don't think that he has something to do with all of us being here for you? And in that moment... Eric Torres, the man, looked at him and said, I will try. The officers were able to pull the man up with Torres' help to safety. And Eric Torres says, as bad as you think you're having it, there is somebody out there who is unfortunately suffering much more than you are. And you can either choose to stand by and do nothing, or you can actually try to make a difference. Well, in the right place, at the right time, Willing and able to do the right thing, Eric Torres, we thank you for your good deeds, sir. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Thank you again for being a part of the program today. We will see you back here tomorrow. Don't forget to subscribe to Town Hall Media and be sure to check out BearingArms.com throughout the day for the latest Second Amendment news and information.